To produce the best possible clinical outcome, the patient must be at the center of any treatment plan. This is why patient selection is at the heart of Medical Service Company's non-invasive ventilator program. Our respiratory therapy ventilator specialists conduct a thorough medical record review to ensure the patient receives the optimal therapeutic benefit. While performing this comprehensive medical review has many advantages, we believe it is important to safeguard the patient from costly out-of-pocket and uncovered medical expenses. Additionally, the record review establishes the medical necessity to confirm the right patient, right therapy at the right time, protecting limited medical resources. Evidence supports that an advanced home-based non-invasive ventilation therapy program can reduce readmission rates and decrease the cost of care. Accordingly, non-invasive ventilation therapy is generally accepted as an effective home-based treatment option in managing severe COPD with persistent hypercapnia. An advanced patient-centered model, such as MSC's NIV program, provides exceptional outcomes for minimizing patient symptoms associated with severe COPD and thereby improving the patient's quality of life. Good afternoon, everyone. We hope you are enjoying a full day of sleep and respiratory education so far. While the morning session combined both sleep and respiratory topics, we will provide respiratory specific lectures this afternoon based on your enrollment in the respiratory tract. These lectures in this tract are only approved by the AARC for CRCE continuing education credit. Kicking off the respiratory tract lineup is Dr. Juan Danny Polito. Dr. Danny Polito is a board certified pulmonologist, critical care specialist, and internist. He has seen improved outcomes for his patients throughout the care continuum with the use of humidified high flow therapy from the critical care environment to the home. Thank you, Dr. Polito, for sharing your knowledge and experience during today's forum. He will be speaking on humidified high flow and emerging new home therapy. We want to remind you to enter your questions under the Engage tab, and Dr. Polito will answer these questions immediately following his lecture. Don't forget to complete and submit your evaluation for each lecture. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for having me here. My name is Danny Polito, and I'm a pulmonary, pulmonary critical care uh, board certified physician for Jacksonville, Florida and the Baptist Health System. I appreciate the honor to give you guys a, a, a brief little talk today about home humidified high flow use and how we've implemented it both with our patient care in the hospital system and how we've used this transition over to home care use. So with that, uh, we'll present the slides that I have at this time. The objectives of this talk we're gonna go over is the COPD pathophysiology, the mechanisms of how high flow heated humidified high flow works, uh, overview clinical research, and then discuss the clinical ideas of how uh, safe and effective care can be used uh, with uh, considering this therapy option for your patients. So historically, COPD has been associated in two different classes of uh, categorized patients. And this is something we've always discussed from med school on, and it still stays true to this day. We talk about patients, kind of the classic chronic bronchitic patients or your emphysematous patients, and they have features suggestive of either or. Our Chronic bronchitis patients are classically known as the blue bloaters, and that's what med students like to use. Uh, but as typical, patients are overweight, have productive cough, are more hypoxic, and they have extremity swelling at times that is difficult and adds more uh, complexity to their care. Whereas the emphysematous patients are typically thinner, uh, older patients. They have severe dys dyspnea, which is shortness of breath with activity. And then also their chest is hyperinflated when you look at them under chest x-ray, such as you can see on this picture. So the diagnosis of COPD. For years and still to this day, we've always relied on clinical factors, both associated risk factors, tobacco being the number one, but there are other associated factors uh, that have played into the damages of the lung tissue, uh, such as industrial workers or other patients who are in uh, contaminated areas that are the potential to breathe in and injure the lung function. Age is another factor. Symptoms, so chronic shortness of breath, chronic cough, and then hospitalizations for repetitive bronchitis would be classic symptoms of these types of situations. Now we'll get to the actual measurement of air function. So persistent airflow obstruction. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means on a couple of slides going forward. But that essentially is what spirometry is, the measurement of airflow. Now, naturally, as we breathe, we should be able to breathe out over 70% of our lung forced air within one second. But patients who have COPD 
have difficulty getting all that air out in one second. So it's a prolonged exhalation. And in these patients, if they are breathing faster for whatever reason, and if they're walking from their car to their home or going to the mailbox, they will tend to breathe a little faster. And if you're breathing faster and your exhalation phase is extended, they're going to start to get into a situation that's called air trapping because they can't get all the air out before the next breath comes in. And then the presence or not a res, uh, reversibility uh, doesn't, uh, does not exclude uh, COPD, but there is a distinguishing factor between asthma and COPD, and we'll also talk about that in a couple of slides. The spirometry, as I, as I said previously, so it's the measurement of airflow. So spiro means air, metry is, I'm sorry, spiro means flow, and metry means measurement. As, as, I, as you can see here in this picture, the leader uh, column on the left indicates how much air volume is being blown out. And on the bottom right is the amount of time it takes to get that air out. So that dotted line on number one is how much we should be able to blow out in one second. Normally, you should be able to get up 70% of your airflow out in one second. And then when you look at the COPD patients, you'll see this extended amount of airflow and residual that is left behind, and that is the classic component of prolonged exhalation. So we've come up with a couple of uh, assessment tools to help classify and distinguish the severity of these patients, some of which are dyspnea scales and the other are CAT scales or CAT assessment. Dyspnea scales really quanti helps quantify us uh, when physician to physician or healthcare provide provider as to how to classify a patient's severity when discussing a patient's uh, case. So zero being their uh, very active with minimal dyspnea, and a four being uh, minimally active with extensive uh, high degree of dyspnea. The CAT assessment really indicates the other associated symptoms, such as cough, phlegm, chest tightness, chest congestion, breathing acti breathlessness activity, uh, and then other limitations with their daily lives. It's, of note, it's important to note, you know, patients, uh, as they do progress with worsening COPD, they tend to do less in their daily activities. And sometimes you have to be, uh, uh, in talking to these patients, uh, a little bit more mindful of that when asking them how, how do they feel about their daily activity. Some patients might say they feel fine, but when you really dive into that, ask them, well, what is it you, really, what is it you do on a daily basis? They'll, uh, they'll explain to you, well, my, my daily activity is getting out of bed, going to the kitchen, going to the couch, uh, after uh, meals, I relax on, t on the couch, watch TVs, uh, or watch TV, and then afterwards, I'll go back to bed, rest for a little while, uh, eat another meal in the afternoon, and then go back to bed. So clearly that daily activity is very limited, and although they've adapted their lifestyle to that, uh, what they don't realize is that the lung function or the lack of is what's really made their quality of life so limited uh, to the point that that's ultimately what they consider uh, able to complete their daily activity. So Take it into consideration when asking those questions, really dive deeper as to what they can or cannot do and make a determination if you think that is or isn't normal. So going into the severity classification based off airflow measurements. So as we said earlier, as how much airflow can be determined and expelled out in one second, the ratio of which what's called forced expiratory volume in one second over forced vital capacity is that 70% mark that I was referring to. The other one is the FEV1, forced expiratory volume in one second, is how we determine whether it's mild, moderate, severe, or very severe. And simply put, uh, mild is a patient with a decreased ratio, but has an FEV1 over 80%. Moderate is a decreased ratio, but an FEV1 above 50, but below 80%. And then severe is any patient that has FEV1 below 50%, but above 30%. And very severe is anybody below 30%. Now, this is very important to determine uh, the severity of patient, the complexity of their uh, uh, disease state, and help uh, use to making decisions on treatment strategies. I will say, though, it, uh, it could be misfilling sometimes. We've had patients with severe or very severe spirometry numbers, but still remain some very active uh, in their lifestyle uh, and have mild to moderate symptoms only. Whereas conversely, we've had patients with mild COPD who have frequent exacerbations, poorly controlled and in and out of the ER. So one particular value or spirometry value is not the end all of all when it comes to classifying how complex these patients are. You really need to see them as a big spectrum and get all the pieces of the puzzle before you make your final decision. The, global, the, the gold assess, uh, uh, 
Association of, of Global Obstructive Lung Disease uh, came up with some other uh, categories that help identify and, and strategically uh, indicate which patients are considered to be a higher risk versus a lower risk. So as mentioned, our, our spirometry values are uh, FPV1 over FVC, which is the ratio referred to earlier, regarding in addition to the spirometry FEV1 percentage, which also determines the severity, but they also wanted us to add, which I think is a true valid point, is the exacerbation component. If they've had over two exacerbations in, in, in one year requiring hospitalizations, or if they've had less than two exacerbations in one year requiring hospitalizations. Now, they do classify us in A, B, C, or D, depending on how this formula uh, falls into the box, but I would not uh, use this as a um, standard conversation method when you're talking to other providers or physicians, although we understand and recognize the academic component of how this values. But I think what to take away from this slide and this uh, uh, concept is that it's not just a spirometry value that tells us the severity, but we have to take in consideration their overall exacerbation rates and their clinical factors uh, when, regarding to their daily activity. So a classic way, when, we, when I present either to another provider, healthcare provider, or a colleague, I will state that a patient has mild, moderate, or severe COPD based off lung function value with frequent or not frequent exacerbations is a, is a classic way to really get the message across on what type of patient you're working with and, and dealing with. So this here shows that COPD really is a spectrum of care. It is a spectrum of multiple different disease states all in one. We were taught back when I was back in med school that asthma was one component, COPD was another component, chronic bronchitis was this, and emphysema was that. But more and more, we really start to really underlie, uh, understand and uh, realize that this is all just overlapping, overlapping spectrum of different disease states. So chronic bronchitis, as I mentioned earlier, is typically the patient who's overweight, has chronic phlegm, chronic mucus production, chronic cough, uh, and has sometimes fluid retention with a progressive dyspnea uh, that limits their activity. Whereas your emphysematous patients are typically your thinner patients, uh, very dyspneic with activity, uh, really zero to no cough. But when you listen to them, they really they have diminished breath sounds and our chest x-ray classically shows hyperinflation. Airflow obstruction can be for a variety of other reasons, uh, obesity, hypoventilation, obstructive sleep apnea. And then your asthmatic patients can be for more of your uh, reactive airway disorders and your, and your allergic patients that have uh, intermittent uh, degrees of obstruction given that whatever ex their exposure is. So clearly, as you see, uh, that there's a multitude of overlap and patients can progress from one diagnosis over to another over time. So that's also another important factor in which classically we've seen quite a bit in our office uh, when patients, uh, when diagnosed with COPD, the classic response would be that they, uh, if they haven't in the past, they would be somewhat upset and taken back by that because everybody in the community uh, associate COPD to chronic tobacco use. And patients with, uh, who we've diagnosed with COPD um, who have never smoked tobacco, we've come to realize and, and educate the patients if they've had asthma for many years and it was poorly controlled, asthma in and of itself can lead to COPD. So it's very important to understand that because it's a spectrum of disease. It's not and or. It's really a, a continuous of, of injured lung bronchial uh, damages that will lead to a chronic obstructive uh, component. Now this, although it's an older slide, but depicts really well, the efforts that have been given or have been performed in the healthcare system globally, nationally, and locally, all to which reduce the more uh, comorbid disorders that causes the highest risks for mortality with great success. Unfortunately, as you can see, COPD has not had the success of the others. Coronary heart disease has had a re drastic reduction over many decades, such as stroke uh, and other cardiovascular disorders. But COPD, has had a steady incline and with mortality and hospitalizations and has sensibly have been exacerbated and made worse with the past couple of years of the pandemic and COVID. When you put it to get into a, a order list of uh, disease states that caught the increased cause of death, heart disease still number one, cancer is number two, cardiovascular, I'm sorry, cerebral vascular disorders and stroke is number three, and COPD with aligned conditions is number four. So it's definitely up there on CMS radar for disorders that are uh, considered high risk and can be very costly to the health system. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of effort, both in the pharmaceutical world and the device world, 
uh, and exact, and especially with over the past couple of years in the COVID world, how do we identify, treat, and maximize optim optimize patient care with chronic lung disease? So as I mentioned earlier, the GOLD workshop report, which came out in the early 2000s, and it stands for Global Initiative in Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease. It, it basically wanted to get out of the, the mindset that COPD was just an abnormal PFT diagnosis. And based off the PFT, we labeled patients and treated. And the reality is that's not the case. Patients, yes, will have abnormal airflow values, but just because they have an abnormal airflow value doesn't necessarily have shown to be the quintessential predictor value of their hospitalizations, their complexity of care, and the mortality. So what they also wanted to do is understand their lifestyle uh, uh, symptomatology and uh, quality of life, uh, introduce uh, educational components to patients uh, so they understand the, the importance of taking their medications. And a classic feature of that is patients are, are known to go to the medical, to healthcare facilities, doctor's offices, ERs, when they have their attacks and their exacerbations, and they are very keen to be in compliant once these attacks occur on whichever inhalers or medications we put them on. But what I've classically seen over the years is that once they feel better, their exacerbation is completed, they feel like COPD is kind of like an infection where they get over, they get to complete their antibiotics, they're done, they can get off their treatment. That has been a, one of the biggest challenges in, my, in, in our population to continue to educate that COPD is a chronic disease that will never go away. It's not curable, it's manageable. So in doing so, we have to continue to educate patients that the need to stay on inhalers. Now, I will say there are times where we do dose adjustments and dose reductions of inhalers, but still the importance of recognizing who's at high risk of exacerbation and educate the patient that inhaler therapy not only gets you out of an exacerbation in the recovery phase, but in the, once you're in the remission phase, it will help prevent that future exacerbation. So that is the key component I would say would emphasize to continue to educate our, our, our patient population that it, despite uh, having to take a medication, although you feel like you're over your exacerbation, is key to make sure you don't have another one. This classic example I give is aspirin for stroke prevention. You don't feel any better when you take that little uh, 81 milligram of aspirin, but there's a good chance if you're a high risk for having a stroke, that if you take that 81 milligram aspirin, your chance of strokes is drastically reduced. So same concept when talking about COPD medications. Uh, if, you're, if you're compliant with your medications, despite feeling good and your quality of life is good, there's a very good chance you're gonna have less exacerbations per year and less hospitalizations um, if you are compliant with your medication. So looking at the anatomical components of the lung, I'm gonna break down briefly what pulmonary function tests consist of. Uh, very simply put, it's three values or three components. Spirometry, which we've already talked about, the measurement of flow, really is airflow through a tunnel. So if you can look at the picture on the right here, is that the main tunnel is the large, the large bronchioles, the trachea, which is the main trachea line going down the middle. And then the bronchioles, as they divide, and they have multiple divisions as they go down all the way to the terminal bronchioles. So all the, the, the measurement of airflow through those tunnels will give us our sp uh, spiromic values. And if there's Airflow obstruction is when we say there's an obstructive lung disease. Now, determine if that obstructive lung disease is permanent or intermittent would indicate whether the patient has COPD or asthma. The next component of the pulmonary function test is the lung capacity. The lung capacity, the lungs are like big balloons. So we want to see how much air can the lungs hold at a total volume inspiratory effort. And with that, we'll get a better understanding of what their capacity is and what they can or cannot do. And then the, old, the last component of the breathing test is the diffusion capacity. The main function of the lung is to get oxygen in the ambient air that we breathe in and breathe it into our system and that will diffuse through the lungs into the blood. And the CO2, which is the byproduct of our metabolism, we breathe out through our lungs and out, back out to the ambient air. So air flow, overall lung volume capacity, and the diffusion of oxygen and CO2 is how we measure patients' basic lung function. As I said earlier, the spectrum of asthma and COPD are both obstructive airflow diseases, but they can, they can progress over time. And if an as poorly controlled asthmatic who is not compliant with their medications or has a very extensive uh, reactive component, uh, if left unchecked, can eventually lead to chronic scarring and bronchial thickening and then to the diagnosis of COPD down the road. But we also know there's three big components of uh, obstructive lung disease. Smooth muscle, smooth muscle contraction, as you can see on the far left. On the far left airway, there's a nice dilated bronchial with a good amount of airflow that could pass through and forth. And then the 
uh, contracted muscle, smooth muscle contracted bronchial, with very l diminished lumen of airflow uh, would cause a patient to be very dyspneic and very uh, tired when trying to breathe or exert themselves. The second component of obstruction is chronic inflammation. So chronic inflammation could be due to from inorganic to organic scenarios. Organic scenarios are viruses, bacteria, funguses, anything that gets in our lungs and causes an inflammatory response. But more commonly, we deal with inorganics. So, page, so seasonal changes, pollen, construction area, tobacco being an, an inorganic component that we inhale, that patients inhale in. Anything that is breathed into the lung that should not be there and then causes inflammation, which is our natural body's response to a particle that is in our lungs that the, the body does not want it to be there. So chronic inflammation will lead to airflow or airway uh, destruction and diminishment. And then the last is mucus production. Our body produces mucus as a way, as a protective measure to clear out the lungs. But in certain instances, uh, it can overproduce and the mucus itself can be very thick and act like a plug and plug up airways. And patients that will have chronic mucus production are patients who are exposed to ambient air or air quality that is continu continuously contaminated or irritant to the lung, such as in smokers. The debris, the tobacco, the nicotine products that is inhaled when they smoke is causing a continuous amount of uh, particle injury and irritation to the lungs for which the lung is constantly trying to flush it out and flush it out and flush it out with this mucus gland production. The mucus gland production can be overwhelming so much so that it ends up clogging and plugging up the airway. So with that, we have a variety of therapies, uh, all of which are inhaled therapies. Some are which are HFA, which means uh, powder, uh, medications that are forced out via compressed gas, and some are which now are becoming more powder-based inhalers that you activate and you have to inhale the powder out of the cartridge to get medication deep into the lungs. Now, we, as I mentioned in the past slide, but both the smooth, smooth muscle contraction, the second component of obstruction is in, uh, inflammation, and the third is mucus production. We, we tailor our therapy based off those three drugs, oh, I'm sorry, those three pathologies. We have medications that are considered anti uh, or, or steroidal. So in, they're in steroid inhalers that affect the inflammatory changes. We have medications that are beta agonists, which are smooth muscle dilators, and that will help open up the airway. And then we have medications that are anticholinergic, which help reduce the mucus production. So over the years, we've had to use a combination of inhalers to get the right effect, depending on what type of disease state or or mechanism was being altered in the patient's airway. But now fortunately, there's been advancements in therapy that now very commonly we start to use triple inhalers. Triple inhalers are medica basically medica inhalers that have all three, uh, steroid, bronchodilator, and anticholinergic, and will affect all three mechanisms all at once. But to, to drive the one final point on this, all inhalers are really meant to treat our spirometry or obstructive disorders. Inhalers do not treat lung capacity disorders. Inhalers does not treat diffusion abnormality disorders. So when we talk about inhaler therapy, you're really talking about airflow obstruction management. Switching gears. So pharmacology is what we were talking about just in the past slide uh, that looks at the uh, types of medications that help affect the air, airflow and optimize airflow management. But now we've come to uh, understanding of how positive pressure airflow, heated humidified airflow, really helps optimize air management and the flow of the bronchioles. Now with this uh, technology that is not new, it's been modified to become more modern and flexible and portable. This is technology that's been around for decades. Uh, first used in the anesthesia world, uh, in the hospital setting as patients come in or out of the OR, uh, is basically positive pressure, but through a nasal cannula. And to make it where it's comfortable and we're not damaging the nasal mucosum, it is heated and humidified. So that helps the mucosum to keep stay nice and moist while we're doing high pressure, higher than usual pressure flow into the lungs. And for years, anesthesiologists found it to be very successful in managing patients post anesthetic as they're coming out of the OR, where that where they quickly realized that low flow oxygen was not sufficient to treat these patients. Now, as that as the uh, Technology developed and, it and high flow became more readily available. We adopted this system into the other aspects of acute care hospital setting, in the ICU, on the general ward, in the progressive care units. And fortunately, 
with uh, the past few years, this has been a lifesaver for COVID patients. Uh, and literally speaking, uh, patients that survived uh, hospital stay were definitely uh, due to uh, the amount of high flow devices that we had in the hospitals. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about high flow, the mechanism, how it works and why it works and how we implement it uh, both what we've, what we've seen in the hospital setting, but really how can we extra extrapolate what we've seen and worked with in the hospital to utilize it in the post-acute and in the home setting. As I mentioned earlier, the high flow setting uh, in the original phase was in post-anesthetic world where we had high pressure tubes built into the wall and they were able to connect into a smaller device and uh, reduce it down to a nasal cannula uh, for which patients can opt up benefit from this type of high pressure. And it's really more the pressure, not necessarily the oxygen. We can optimize oxygen uh, concentration if need be, but it's key to understand when we talk about high flow, it's really pressure. It's different between nasal cannula. When we say nasal cannula, it's really low flow oxygen pressure or oxygen therapy. When we talk about high flow, it's high pressure oxygen therapy. And it's important to understand that for the respiratory therapist, who may or may not have been familiarized or utilized this service, uh, this, this type of therapy, in that when you set high flow parameters, you're setting two separate parameters. You're setting the pressure parameter or the leader flow, and you're setting the oxygen parameter or the oxygen concentration. And what you'll be surprised is a lot of times with just the leader flow, you don't need as much oxygen therapy. And what we've already seen through many ICU trials Oxygen therapy at high concentrations is actually toxic to the lung. Anything above 60% FiO2 really causes free radical damage to the lung. So the, the past thought of just somebody who's short of breath, put them on a non-rebreather or a high uh, oximizer to get their SATs better, we've come to realize that's actually more detrimental and causing harm to these patients. So what we want is optimize pressure flow, optimize pharmacologically, and then minimize oxygen therapy uh, to the point where it's safe, but we're not over hyper oxygenating these patients. So our goal to optimize spontaneous breathing is really, in essence, we're looking at respiratory support, airway hydration, patient comfort, uh, because the alternative to high flow and patients who needed higher pressure was BiPAP. And if anybody has ever seen or worked with patients who are on BiPAP, it is very cumbersome uh, for patients who are in distress, uh, can become more, can cause more anxiety for patients who have claustrophobic uh, features that are uh, definitely more difficult to manage. And then nutrition becomes a, uh, a difficulty situation when dealing with positive pressure, full face BiPAP masks. So then the last is ox supplemental oxygenation, uh, which stated in the past, you have to be careful with that because High oxygen concentration, although it might fix your saturation number, but you're doing so at the risk of damaging lung tissue. And as stated, uh, oxygen pressure therapy can be given a variety of different ways. Standard in the hospital setting, invasive when critically ill, uh, and unfortunately with COVID, we had to deal with a lot of this, uh, is intubating a patient. So that's an invasive airway positive pressure. It's an ET tube that goes in through the mouth and into, connects into the airway, and it connects to a ventilator machine that which ultimately adjusting for optimal lung function. The non-invasive ventilation is a full face mask that covers nose and mouth uh, that will optimize the pressure of the lung without having to put a tube into their airway. Patients are more awake during this situation, but as you can imagine, nutrition cannot be provided. Uh, medications will be very difficult for oral medication route. And then the anxiety component of having this strapped to their face for a period of time until they recover, uh, it just adds more to their anxiety and could cause more dyspnea and tachypnea. So, the last is the nasal high flow apparatus, much smaller approach, easier uh, manageable for a patient and nursing as patients can take their medications, they can eat while they're on high flow, they can converse with their family members, and they can try to resume a normal, somewhat of a normal lifestyle uh, in this setting. Now, our experience in the hospital setting has allowed for patients to be more mobile uh, in the room, active in work with physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, but as we see the transition of high flows equipment and services utilized in post-acute care, we are now having a, a patients uh, doing their physical therapy in the uh, post-acute uh, skilled nursing facility on high flow, and it's portable, and it can be walked around the, the, the physical therapy lab or the gym as they're doing their ambulatory exercises and or cardiopulmonary exercises. And we'll talk a little bit more about how this can be utilized in a home setting. 
So this is a, in, a couple slides on that, the physiology of how uh, nasal high flow, uh, heated nasal high flow uh, has really showed to optimize lung volume, lung capacity, uh, and minimize lung injury to the mucosal membrane. The nasal apparatus as seen, as I mentioned before, smaller, so allows for patient's mouth to be functional, both for medications, nutrition, and, and, and discussion. But as you would imagine, in uh, using a higher liter of flow through the nasal passages can irritate the nasal passages. And if you did not use the heated component, you will run the patient at a much higher risk of epistaxis, which is bleeding through the nose. The mucosum inside the nasal passages is very, very thin, very sensitive, and high flow pressure uh, you run the risk of causing some irritation. But they were able, has, over the years, has been able to figure out with the heated humidified component, it actually helps moisturize that airflow. And what we found is a variety of things. It helps sinus congestion uh, uh, alleviate a lot of the sinus issues. It helps dr for patients with post-nasal drip to help clear that uh, sinus, chronic sinus scenarios. Uh, and it helps from a overall airflow component to help minimize uh, any damages uh, when talking about uh, back of their throat uh, and, and dryness that they get when they're using any other type of oxygen therapy. So as patients, as you can see on this bottom screen here, on bottom uh, right, normal respiratory effort and compared to uh, high flow, nasal high flow respiratory effort. So this is on the inspiration. So inspiratory pressure as a uh, noted on both high flow and spontaneous uh, is somewhat uh, similar as they go in, but what's noted is the exhalation, the expiratory pressure. So on exhalation, if you're breathing out against just room air, uh, there's no real pressure. There's no pressure you're breathing out against, but when you're breathing out against positive pressure that is going in, that causes what's called the PEEP effect. And PEEP stands for positive end expiratory pressure. And caught by allowing the, for the PEEP effect to work, what you're essentially redoing is not allowing the lungs to fully deflate. Imagine a balloon, a little child balloon or a balloon we use for birthday parties. And if you blow it all the way up, and if you were to let go of the valve and let all the air out, that is essentially what happens uh, with exhalation on spontaneous breathing. Now, our lungs do not fully deflate and collapse like a balloon, but in some instances they will. If a patient is very inactive, or post-surgery, or in bed for a prolonged period of time, or their neurological condition uh, via dementia or any other uh, chronic condition, orthopedic condition that doesn't allow them to get up and ambulate, they will actually deflate so much so that the lung will start to collapse, and that's called atelectasis. Atelectasis can be painful. It can cause uh, uh, tachypnic, or, which is increased respiratory rate. If left untreated, can cause an increase in risk for infection, and then pneumonia. Uh, and then we'll drop their oxygen saturations and, call, and make them at a higher risk for a respiratory event. So yes, in essence, if patients are very immobile, bed bound, or have neurological conditions that hamper their breathing capacity, you do have to worry about atelectasis as being a serious complication. And one way to help prevent this is by or adding positive pressure, uh, expiratory pressure on their exhalation phase with this type of therapy. And as you can see here, once again, looking at the inspiratory expiratory pressure flow, by allowing this expiratory pressure flow as the lungs are trying to exhale out and there's a little bit of pressure, it equates to about five millimeters of mercury of PEEP uh, pressure that we use on a ventilator, uh, which is about our starting PEEP pressure uh, and uh, on mechanical ventilation. Uh, what we have found in, in that scenario, when the lungs have this positive pressure, they're not expelling all the lung airflow that or lung capacity all at once. So they're able on their next inspiratory breath, have not they don't need to take as big of a breath. What we've seen, uh, what we can measure out on patients' tidal volume breathing, which is normal breathing, when spontaneously breathing compared to high flow breathing, the spontaneous breathing, because they're exhaling all the air out and because they have a, a respiratory condition, they're going to be very tachypnic and they're Breaths are going to be very rapid, very shallow until they and optimize their lung injury, whichever it may be, whether it's an infection or some other type of inflammatory change. But in patients who have positive pressure, 
their respiratory tidal volume is going to reduce in rate and their volume capacity is going to drastically increase in size. So now with every esp- uh, uh, respiratory effort, the muscles that are utilized to breathe are now having to work less often and more efficient with every breath. Now, this is a nice video, we'll unfortunately be able to play, but um, it's basically from Corley et al. She's, uh, way, she was able to, to visually uh, show how nasal high flow uh, worked in the patients with uh, compared to spontaneous oxygen therapy. And the sum of this video, basically what, what she was able to show with computer, uh, computer tomography, uh, is that with patients with pressure high flow, the residual effects of airflow retention or lung volume retention was essentially maintained and optimized when used high flow pressure versus patient on low flow oxygen. And the, the risk of atelectasis was much higher in the low flow oxygen rate. So this is just a nice video. And if you like, I can, uh, I can forward this along for you guys to have uh, for future discussions, uh, but really demonstrates nicely how high pressure flow oxygen or high nasal high flow really does a great job of alveolar retention or recruitment. And that's a phrase that we like to use a lot is how do we recruit more lung tissue? And this is what does. And you can see a little bit by the pictures here. This is low flow oxygen and the blue is actual lung tissue that has air. This is the, the circle is the thoracic cavity. So the dark area are lung is lung tissue without air. This is a patient on a nasal high flow. And as you can already see, air flow and air recruitment in the lung tissue itself is drastically improved when using nasal high flow. Now, but leading to the humidification effect. As I mentioned earlier with the nasal passages, the heated uh, nasal airflow, uh, it, if used without uh, humidification, will drastically irritate the nasal passages and lead to risk of uh, bleeding in, uh, in the nasal passages. But with the humidification effect, the bleeding is, uh, has, has since been eliminated and minimized. Uh, so now that is a, a benefit feature that high flow op, uh, offers. In the airway itself, what happens with patients, uh, whether it's chronic bronchitis or uh, any acute inflammatory change, mucosal cells uh, can get easily damaged. Once they're damaged is where uh, when this cellular line of mucosal with cilii, which is our, our local defense mechanism that helps us protects us from any intrusions, viruses, bacteria, uh, or foreign objects to invade into our bloodstream, invade into our bronchioles. Uh, But unfortunately, with any kind of acute injury, whether it's an infection or whether it's a a cold temperature, um, such as changes in climate, uh, these cells are very sensitive to changes and can be damaged. Once damaged, that's where it allows for entry for bacteria and viruses into the bronchial system or bloodstream uh, in which uh, patients can uh, lapse into a very severe uh, exacerbation, whether it's pneumonia, whether it's bronchitis, or whether the feared sepsis type situation. So how do we help optimize and prevent damage to these microcilii of the bronchioles? Well, lubrication has been found, humidification, to help moisten these membranes. It's the same concept with our lips. We've all experienced in in cold weathers, the dryness of our lips. And when they get chapped, when they get dry, they get cracked, they get open. And that allows for sores to open up uh, and bacteria or viruses can get in and then can cause surrounding inflammation and irritation of our lips and our mucosal membrane. And by adding, applying chapstick or any kind of moisturizing agent to our lips helps prevent that type of damage occurring at our lips. Same exact concept with heated humidified high flow. By allowing the humidification effect to moisten and keep moisturized those cilii will help protect these airways uh, and any type of injury that they might suffer. The, so in summary with the, uh, the physiological effects of nasal high flow, what studies have shown that it improves ventilation and gas exchange. As I stated earlier, it reduces the respiratory rate by using the high nasal high flow in, the, in whichever setting, uh, hospital setting, post-acute care setting, or home setting, you're essentially allowing the patient to take bigger, deeper breaths and not having to take these rapid, shallow, low breaths, uh, which conserves energy, uh, conserves muscle uh, fatigue, uh, and allows patient's comfort level to improve. 
It reduces carbon dioxide by method of airflow washout or air washout. CO2 can retain in our what's called dead space or the area inside of our lungs, like the trachea and the bronchioles, where there's no gas exchange. And if the ventilation is shallow and not, uh, uh, if the effort isn't there, the CO2 can build up just in those spaces alone. But with nasal high flow, it can actually wash out the CO2 to so help reduce patients with chronic CO2 retention. It increases tidal volume, as I stated before, by increasing the PEEP effect when they exhale out, their next breath is gonna be bigger than the one prior. And it increases end expiratory lung volume, as I stated, uh, by allowing this PEEP effect pressure. Mucus airways are gonna be uh, help maintain to be clear, uh, be given the hydration effect, uh, and by lubricating the airways, in the past slides, as I mentioned, a hyper secretion of mucus can plug up, get thick and dry up and cause airflow obstruction due to plugging of the airways. By adding the heated humidified component, it lubricates these mucus uh, accumulations. So it allows the, the, these mucus globs to be more liquefied and easier to expel when you cough, uh, when you cough it out. And then ultimately improves oxygenation. It allows by optimizing pressure, optimizing humidification, the reduction and the need for actual oxygen therapy, which will, op will minimize the risk of free radical damage to the lung tissue. And all in all, which will improve patient comfort because they're not strapped onto a big mask uh, and they can, they can easily talk, communicate and eat and participate in their therapies. Once again, both at home and at, in a rehab center, wherever they may be. Switching gears to a study that was uh, reported back in uh, uh, just earlier this year, 2022, from Japan, which I found to be very helpful in this type of, uh, or in this discussion that we're having today. This was from Nagata, and as I mentioned in Japan, who ultimately wanted to determine if nasal high flow uh, compared to regular standard low flow oxygen therapy at home would reduce exacerbations for patients who are chronically known as our chronic stable hypercapnic patients. These are our most vulnerable patients that uh, they have C, uh, severe COPD. Uh, they are frequent exacerbators. They are optimized on, on medication therapy. Uh, but despite all efforts, best efforts, they still have a high risk of exacerbating and coming back to the hospital. So what he ultimately determined was uh, wanted to see if utilizing uh, nasal high flow therapy in addition to the low flow oxygen therapy compared to just low flow oxygen therapy alone. So what he was able to do is in 52 weeks, the nasal high flow component was a therapy that was provided to these patients from anywhere from four to eight hours a day. And then when they were not on the nasal high flow, they would revert back to their low flow oxygen therapy. And then the next day they get back on the nasal high flow for four to eight hours a day versus the standard uh, group, which was just low flow oxygen every day, all day for 52 weeks. So this study I was able to demonstrate as when he uh, separated the two groups, which is a randomized open trial, um, looking at the nasal high flow uh, in combination with low flow oxygen therapy and the low flow oxygen therapy uh, for a period of 42, I'm sorry, uh, 52 weeks. Uh, you can see the amount of patients that were separated in each group, 47 in the nasal high flow with oxygen therapy combination versus 46 patients uh, just on the nasal uh, uh, low flow oxygen therapy alone. So the inclusion exclusion criteria. Inclusion criteria, they had to be ages over 40 years old, diagnosed with COPD, gold stage two to four, uh, receiving low flow oxygen therapy at least 16 hours a day for the past month, had a hypercapnia with increased CO2 over 45, and having COPD exacerbations that are moderate to severe in the past year. Um, they had obviously provided written consent. And the exclusion criteria was patients that were unstable with co other comorbid conditions. Oh, uh, obstructive sleep apnea was an uh, exclusion. Asthma was an exclusion. A recent exacerbation of four weeks was an exclusion. Uh, nocturnal use of positive pressure and any kind of cognitive or psychological impairment was also an exclusion. Primary outcomes. So the basic primary outcome was, can they reduce exacerbation in a 52-week 52 52 period? Secondary outcomes, they wanted to look at some physiological parameters, quality of life parameters, and uh, activity parameters, all of which uh, we'll talk about in the next slide. So nasal high flow was administered using the AirVo2 plus and OptiFlow nasal cannula over a 
at least four hours, as I mentioned, but up to eight hours. And the, the leader flow that was implemented was anywhere from 30 to 40 liters per minute. Actual nasal high flow usage was reported on average about seven hours. But as you can see, very comfortable, very easy to use it is in a home setting. Uh, the mean average rate of liter flows around 28. And then the temperature setting uh, is around 34 to 37. And that's a neat feature that I, didn't, I had mentioned in the past. With Airvo, my Airvo, you can do temp, you can do uh, liter flow adjustments, which is a classic feature. You can do uh, oxygen adjustments, but you can also do temperature adjustments. So patients who prefer higher than normal temperature or more of a room temperature, uh, you can adjust that to make sure that is uh, optimized so the patient can be more comfortable. Uh, so these features are allowed for patient uh, adjustment use. So the results. Nasal high flow in, homes, in the home was significantly, uh, found to significantly reduce the rate of moderate to severe exacerbations. As you can see here, the rate of patients without exacerbations over a linear graph, uh, the low oxygen flow is in the light blue, and the nasal high flow combination with low oxygen flow is in the, dark, is in the green color. And over time, over a period of 52 weeks, you can tell that the amount of patients that, had excess, uh, that did not have exacerbations uh, was uh, significantly improved in the nasal high flow ca category versus the patients who had uh, just low flow oxygen by itself. With a uh, statistically valued p value at the end uh, regarding to statistical analysis. So, in stable hypercapnic COPD patients with recent history of exacerbation, it significantly reduced the rate of moderate to severe exacerbations. It prolonged the duration without moderate to severe COPD exacerbations. When, uh, when comparing a variety of nasal high flow studies over the years, going as far back as 2014, all the way up to current, uh, you can see where na uh, nasal high flow uh, therapy has been very successful in a variety of different ways, whether it's reducing uh, uh, exacerbations, improving quality of life, reducing hypercapnia, and improving oxygenation, all of which have led both what we do in our current practice, in the hospital setting, in the post-acute care setting, and even at home setting, uh, it allowed us to adjust our mechanisms and therapies uh, to optimize these patient care and reduce hospitalizations. This is a study that we were in the midst of uh, uh, enrolling. Um, unfortunately, as COVID hit, we had to put this study on pause, but we were looking at nasal high flow uh, versus standard of care in the hospital for mild to moderate exacerbations. The moderate to severe group obviously went to the ICU and would uh, would get all ICU type therapies, but the your mild exacerbators that required hospitalization that did not require ICU, uh, we were uh, we were looking into nasal high flow throughout their hospital course versus standard of care low flow oxygen while they received their medical management steroids bronchodilators and antibiotics until after discharge and to see to assess their length of stay and the risk of readmissions post uh, discharge. So this current study has been put on pause due to COVID, but since COVID is now fortunately, hopefully wrapping up uh, or diminished in regards of case volume, uh, this study is to be looked at and, and hopefully come back online. And with that, I thank you for your time. Hope, uh, look forward to any questions you might have and I hope the best for you.